Um, okay, welcome guys. Um, I want to get right into it because we have a lot to get to today. Um, like, has anybody seen me give this talk before here? Okay. On YouTube. On YouTube, yeah. So this is going to be kind of an extension on that. So I've, been, I've given this talk, I've been speaking here at Recommend Audio Fest for a few years, and this is for, 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 for <coughs> fairly obvious reasons. Uh, I kind of shifted, this one's stuck, and I sh I've shifted topics every year a little bit, but after a few years ago, this one really started hitting on the YouTube, on the YouTube presentation I gave before. And so I, I decided to stick with this and evolve this, just because I think this, this topic is really, hits home for a lot of us. Um, so I guess let's just kind of get into this. Um, uh, my name is Jeff Merkel. I teach at the University of Colorado Denver in recording arts. I've been teaching physics for a long time, but I also run a recording. I've been a matching engineer for 20 years. Um, I kind of come from the pro audio world, but I, then I've also kind of shifted into boutique manufacturing. So I do loudspeaker manufacturing, design, R&D testing, but I also do a lot of acoustic consulting, that kind of stuff too. And so this all kind of falls in the same category of this, this measurement and testing stuff. So um, basically, I want, I, like, for me, um, I'm a big DIYer. I, 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 don't, I fix my own car, I do all my own construction, I do all my own acoustics. And, what, and, and over the last few years, as technology has really progressed, the tools and the technology for us doing our own measurements have come down significantly. The point, there's no excuse that we shouldn't, that we shouldn't be taking our own measurements. Of course, the trickier part, anybody can take a measurement. It's interpretation that's the really tricky part. And that's, that's what we're gonna dive into just a little bit. So, um, so just real quick, why do we take that DIY me or why take measurements? Um, part of it is, when you look at spec sheets, or when you're, when you're up in the rooms uh, up here, looking at speakers and listening to speakers and, and sound systems, one of the things that, that gets kind of glossed over is that we have to really consider that the speaker and the room are one system. It's not just the speaker. You can't just look at spec sheets and go, this is a good speaker, that's a bad speaker, that's a good speaker, that's a bad speaker. Your room has a huge influence on you, and you have to consider that as one complete entire system here. So, and the only way you're really gonna get a picture of that, you can do all these theoretical models and run all these, all these simulations, but until you actually get the speaker in the room and actually take, start taking measurements, are you really gonna come, is this gonna come to life? And you're gonna understand all the little nuances from everything from furniture to whatever electronics you have in your room. All these different things are gonna come into play that are way too difficult for you to actually simulate. So to, to doing your own measurements and doing this is gonna be the one way that you're really gonna be able to get this. Um, the other one is that your ears are subjective. For, I've, been doing the, I've been coming to these audio conferences for quite a few years and you hear a lot of crazy stuff about how to tune your system using these. And to me, I'm like, this, this is so subjective. Whether you're having a good day, a bad day, add a few drinks, it's late, it's early, it's whatever, you're gonna, you're, you're, your perception's gonna change every single time, but this is not. This is gonna give you the same number, or it should give you the same number every single day. And if, it does, if it's not giving you the same number every single day, that means something's wrong with your system, or environmental factors, or something in there. But at least you can reduce the variables in the system here so that what you're, what you're, what you're, what you're tuning with, and, and don't get me wrong, your ears are amazing, amazing, amazing tools. Um, but they're still considered subjective, uh, whether you've been listening to a lot of loud music, a lot of quiet music, whatever. These don't care. These do. So that's why, uh, th that's why I firmly believe that we should be taking, you should be doing your measurements with mics. Um, and that information is just power. So, to me, audiophilia is finding the weak link in your system and upgrading it. It's this constant game of upgrading your system. But how do you find the weak link in your system? And this is one of those, this is one of those snoopers that will give you, that gives you that information, some little more insight as to what you, what's going on inside your system there. So, and again, this, is, this can really help you make a lot of bang for your buck decisions. And for me, honestly, the biggest bang for the buck is usually an acoustic treatment. So that's, gonna, that's, that's, that's one of the things, especially when you start treating your room and your system, or your speaker and your room as one complete system, you'll find how important treatment is in your room. So um, that's, that's, that's a big part of it. All right, sorry, I know I'm speaking fast, a little caffeine. <laughs> but we have a lot to get through. And, and the point is, um, yeah. I just have a question about that acoustic treatment. Um, I presume you're referring to materials and certain positions. Yep. But how would you con contrast and kind of weigh that against speaker location? That, and so that's one of the things, that actually, I'll, be, I'll, I'll address that a little bit here when we talk, well, I'm going to be talking more in terms of subwoofer lo like location type stuff. But um, that's one of these things that you, that, that's the cool thing about this is that it's, taking measurements is free. So you basically can just move this around and you can just start checking it out. You're like, oh, put this over here, move the speaker here. Yes, and again, you can run all the simulations all you want. And they are really, they do help. There's some simulation tools that we have that I'll be showing here in a little bit. 
and they're, they're, they're pretty useful, more, more useful in the low frequency type range stuff. But in the high frequency range, uh, high mids, um, you can make some informed physics decisions, but uh, most of the time you, could, if you, with, you have to play with the cards you, you're dealt. You know, we all want to upgrade our systems, but we have limited budgets. So you have to work with what you've got. But what it can show you is that by trial and error, what's effective and what's not. So um, th ask me that one more time. Let me make sure I refer, I'm answering that. Well, I, I just wanted you to sort of compare and contrast the, uh, the w w which was, had more of an influence. Mater oh, materials. material position or speaker position? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, that's kind of an apples and oranges thing. Because one of them is going to be absorption and one of them is just going to be, um, Reflection, I guess, no, I guess they're, they're, they are, they're of course, related to one another. But where you put your speaker is you're going to have the same amount of acoustic energy in the room. It's just going to be set up a little bit, the way it's going to radiate, it's going to be a little bit different. Versus where you put your treatment is going to uh, determine how much, well, in the case of absorption, how much you're going to be pulling out of the room. So I think they are two slightly different discussions. But, um, most of it is going to be where you put your speakers in the room are going to determine, um, yeah, the, 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 like how it affects the, the, the room modes, which we're going to talk about here in just a couple minutes. Let's, let me come back to that. Let, let, like, don't, don't let me off the hook with that, but okay. let, let's, let, let me come back to that when we start actually talking about the simulation stuff. So, um, so it's, it's, it's easy. It's cheap. We should all be doing this. Um, <coughs> at, at least, like... I loan out my, all my measuring gear all the time, uh, it's, it, but you can buy it for pretty cheap. I'll go over the gear here in just a minute. Um, but what I want to emphasize here is, again, because I know I'm speaking fast here, all I'm trying to do is set the stage and encourage you to go out and do this. There's no way you can become like, highly proficient in this in a one-hour discussion here. So um, this is something I and my students and a lot of people um, spend a really long time with on this. But my goal here to do today is to show you, number one, how easy it is to take a measurement. And number two, just throw a teaser out there on a little couple of the nuggets on the acoustics of this, but I'll give you some more resources how to take this further and learn on your own, um, and then of course start up discussions on forums and, 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 something, and, and so on. I know you're talking about room measurement. I've played with room measurement for years, and I find the software is not user friendly. And, and that's my biggest opposition to room measurement is how do you generate a good pink noise or white noise to get your baseline to get an accurate room measurement? Because it seems like you're messing with your SPL to get a yep. certain level to get a good baseline. And then yeah. how do you get that input from the laptop to the stereo? We'll do that right here. We're going to do that live today. And I'm going to show you, yes, there's a lot of different ways to approach this. But I'm going to show you the cheapest and easiest and best way that, I can, that I've come up with for, the, for this. Again, this is, there's a lot of different ways to do this, and I agree. I've been down that road for many years, too. Just buying expensive, arcane, user-unfriendly, that only works with Windows 95, and you have to use Syria ports, and like, I mean, weird stuff like that. <laughs> like, but the, the things have come a long way in a few years, and so I think, so I think, uh, I think we're, we're on the right track, and I think um, there's, some, there's, some, there's some more commercial ones, and there's some also some freeware type stuff, and I'm gonna go over the cheap, easy ones for you, with you today. So let's get into it, actually. Let's, let's talk about it. So what I'm going to do, so again, the, 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 talk, what we're, the goal here is we're going to first talk about just taking measurements, and then we're going to take a look at interpretation. So the first part of it is the hardware side of this. What do we need to take this? So we need, we need a mic, a measurement mic. Now, not just any old mic will work. There's all sorts of apps now for your phone that, will do, that, that claim to do some, actually, I'm just going to show this, um, do some pretty interesting stuff. Um, but... To do this right, I actually have to pick one of these up. This is pretty cool. Um, it's, a measurement, it's a measurement mic and ring out system for your phones. It's a calibrated mic. So you can actually drop this on and take calibrated measurements. So it's got an output so you can actually run sweeps and everything. Um, but you can also just, just do some listening. 13 bucks. Uh, or, or maybe 15 bucks, I can't remember. From Parts Express. It's a date and audio thing. Um, pretty neat. Just a cool little tool. I'm going to keep this in my bag. Can you use it as a line level? Um, I believe so. Like, when you say network cut analyzer, like... Well, like, um, if you had an active crossover, do a loop to get, you know, it and then normalize it and then put the crossover in to... Oh, yeah, I think you could do... I think you probably could. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it doesn't do line in. It's only line, it's, it's only mic in. 
So you can't. So you have to do acoustic measurements with it. You can't do electrical measurements with it. Is that, is that what you mean? Like if you want to run your, if you want to loop your, do an electrical measurement on your crossover, you can't do that. But you can do acoustic measurements with your, your crossover there. For something like that, again, I'd use smart or, or not even smart. Oh, so the software on the phone is calibrated to that particular microphone. Apparently. So again, I just got this. Okay. <laughs> so, so it is a microphone. It is a microphone. Okay. Yeah. So it's just it's just a mic in right there, and then this is line out. Got so it. stereo line out and mic in. What's the number or name of that? Thing? So it's called the IMM. Um, Dayton Audio. This is from Parts Express, who's usually here showing at these shows. They weren't here this year, so I had to actually, they, they loaned me actually gear. They sent me all this gear out to give this talk. So, because um, they usually, they're usually, I'll just usually go to their booth and borrow it. But pretty neat. Like, I think it's like 15, maybe it's 15 bucks. I can't remember exactly. I put in a big order, so I had a lot of different things in there. So I couldn't, I don't remember exactly what it was. But it comes in a cool little case, and apparently it's calibrated, and you can look up the serial number. And, and run these ca calibration things. So that comes in a little cool metal case. So I'll keep that with me all the time. The other side of it is though, if we want to take a semi, well, I want you to say semi, I'll call them pro. Because again, the pros are using the same, same sort of tools. They, they run a different ranges of cost. But so the Dayton EMM6, that's a measurement microphone. I actually have a couple of those, but they weren't at home. I loaned them out. So I don't have them with me right now. But um, the, other one, uh, the other one is the Dayton UMM6. This guy right here, 90 bucks. This, and this is my, my strong, strong suggestion. This is my, my suggestion du jour for this, for this kind of thing. It's a USB-based measure, measurement microphone. Um, and it basically is just, all you do is plug it in, and it works. I, like, well, I'm on Mac. The, on PC, I don't know if you need to download any drivers or not, but um, arguably it should work. I, I believe it's class compliant, so it should probably work on Linux as well if you want, if you want to go that road. Um, and it comes with a, basically, it's called the UMM6, 90 bucks, comes in a little case. They give you a little tiny tripod, but that's effectively useless. <laughs> so, I mean, it's cool for like doing desktop measurements, but you're getting reflections and stuff. The other part of it is you're gonna need to get a, a reasonable mic stand. Um, you can use like tripods and get special fittings and all that kind of stuff for them, but it's, this is really hard to do without an actual microphone stand. Go to Guitar Center, spend 15 bucks, and get, a, get, a, get just a, a mic stand. This one I, like, I cut down and mod it so that I can fit it in small spaces. But um, microphone stands are pretty inexpensive, and they're, <laughs> believe me, they're really useful. You, trying to work without a mic stand, you're going to rig up all sorts of weird taped and, like, things and bar stools and that kind of stuff to try to get these things in the right spot. And it's not worth it. Um, or Amazon Prime or whatever. Um, but then you can go up, and I didn't actually, I, my, uh, my Audix mic is my field mic that I use for a lot of recording, this, this fourth one down, TM1, 300 bucks. And then this is my Earthworks uh, M30, so this is 650 bucks. This is my one that I use actually like my lab, my, my, this one goes up to 30 kilohertz flat, and so that's why I use this one. But again, for most, for, for most regular in-room measurements, these guys are perfect. They come with a calibrated calibration file, you just drop it in, and it, it, it reads effectively completely flat. Um, Part of the reason that you need to use these kind of microphones, the way they, the way, the way, the, the reason they look the way they do, is for diffraction. This is they're omnidirectional, so you don't even need to point it at any. You don't need to point it at a source. When I when I think of measurement, it you know intuitively will point it at the speaker, but you don't really have to. You can just point it straight up. You can point it away from the speaker. Doesn't even really matter. What's up? Even in the high frequencies. Even the high frequencies. We're going to get into that. Twenty kilohertz is this big. If it's bigger than the diaphragm of the mic, it diffracts around it and acts omnidirectional. Hence the size of this capsule. That's why they're so tiny right there. So we'll talk a little bit about, we're getting into some physics today, a little bit. Um, yes, you have to do a little bit of math. That's OK. <laughs> um, you need some sort of DAC. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the pro audio world, we call them interfaces. But in the hi-fi world, we call them DACs. So I'm using, in this case, just a little focus right right here. This is a pro audio interface, but it works effectively like any other DAC that you'd see anywhere here. But you need some sort of computer out, audio out. So, and, and arguably USB based, um, you know, there's, there's other kind of forms, but that's pretty much the standard most of these days. So I'm just using this as a DAC right now, and I'll show this, the, the signal flow here in just a minute. But this is 150 bucks. For me, when I'm using this, I can use this as also as an in. So this is not just a DAC, it's also A to D, D to A. So I would go microphone into this, and then out of this to the speaker. So um, you can use this if you happen to have pro audio type interfaces, those work really well too. So. Um, but anything with phantom power with mic will work. These are phantom power. These are condenser mics that need phantom power. Um, don't worry about it if you don't know what that means. <laughs> Just buy one of those. You're done. You're done. Okay. And on the software side, here's what we've got. I'm going to demonstrate today Room EQ Wizard because it's free. It's awesome. And who's here? Who, who's used it? Anybody here used it? Cool. Um, Room EQ Wizard. It's amazing for what it costs. Zero. <laughs> 
Uh, this, this software should cost a lot more than it does. But this guy, I, I don't know if the, it's, it's, it's a, so I think it's a British guy. It just makes it and gives it away. It's Java-based. Um, and it used to be pretty unfriendly on Mac until recently. Um, it was way, way easier to do this on PC, but now it's, got, it's come a long way. But it's Mac, Mac Linux, and PC based. Um, Linux is okay. Oh, I said, but it's, I said Linux, uh, Mac is okay, but sort of weird. It's not anymore. They've actually ironed out all those, those, those weird, weirdities. Arda, that's another one. That's one of those arcane ones we were talking about, these kind of underground ones. It's Windows only. It's 100 bucks. It's written guy, I think, it's like a Czech professor um, in the Czech Republic, I think, or maybe, I can't remember. Is the result not yeah, it's, it's actually really good, but yes, it's not friendly. You have to dig and you have to learn their own methodology and stuff. But it gives really good results. But they're not always the prettiest and I don't know. Again, 100 bucks isn't a, isn't a bad deal, but it's still, it's still tough. FuzzMeasure Pro, it's a free to try, 150 bucks to buy, it's Mac only. This is a really good one, pretty neat. But it's 150 bucks if you want to start taking real measurements with it. Um, it's, it's a little outdated. I don't know if it's been updated for a while, but it's a pretty neat piece of software. Again, it's, it's Mac only. And then Smart Live. Smart Live is one of the big industry standards. Used, it's used heavily in the live, live audio field for calibrating huge arrays. When you go to any gigantic concert, this is what they're using. I use my map for this for my master's thesis. It's a great piece of software, it's fairly expensive, but um, very well supported. It's got a huge community and a huge user base. So there's good forums and they're really responsive as far as answering questions. So whereas something like Ruby Q Wizard is gonna be more, well, it's got a huge follower user base as well, but the, the manufacturer, or I guess the developer, isn't, isn't really heavily involved in, in uh, communication with it. So it's a more, it's more the, the forums are really good on it. And the forums are, are in the Home Theater Shack. So the Home Theater Shack is the website, is the main forum for Ruby Q Wizard. And it's, uh, it, was originally, it was originally developed for like home theater enthusiasts to work on their subwoofers, but it's expanded into just an amazing piece of software. So, is, is the smart live is, you know, it's obviously by far the most expensive uh -huh. and meant, meant for prototype applications. Does it have more features um, uh, like for spatiality or large? No, or it's gonna they're points? doing more things like like time delays and doing for like line array array uh, line array alignment type of things and doing t uh, the, al like alignment with for huge PA systems and, th and things like that. So there's no, for, for the general user, there would be no significant advantage. That actually, I haven't used it for a while, that, that said. I haven't used it in a while, but um, actually the developer is here in town, a, a smart, and actually he's gonna come talk to our school here in, for an AES event here in a couple weeks, so and maybe next week. So I'll actually get to play with it and talk to him about it. Um, it's, it, but you can, it's, got, it's got a free trial, so you can download it and play with it and, 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 and run through his paces and see if you, there's something that, you think is significantly better about it. But again, I admittedly, I haven't used it for a long time. I used it years ago, and I, I liked it, but because um, the school owned a license for it, so I never actually owned a license for it. So, um, But some people are really hardcore followers of that. What was the brand of the deck? Focusrite, so it's a pro audio brand, 150 bucks for this guy. There's a bunch of them out there in about that range. If you go on Sweetwater or Musician's Friend or even Amazon or something like that, there's a, there's a ton. This was the Scarlet 2 i2, two, two in, two out. Um, okay, let's let's take a look at this. So, if I was using the Scarlet right here, sure. yes. Question. I bought one of those mics, and as part of the bundle, I got Omni Mic Pro. Yes. Software. I haven't had time to use it. That I, you know, I forgot. I didn't actually put that up there. Omni Mic Pro is also a product. It comes with <coughs> it's essentially this, and then it comes with some in-house software. So, also from Dayton Audio, from Parts Express, it comes with software. And it was would you, was it three hundred bucks, I think, or something like that. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think it was that much. Okay. Sure. About 300 bucks. Yeah, I feel like it's about 300 bucks now. I haven't played with it. And actually, when I was, when I was asking uh, Parts Express that, about this, they're like, hey, have you tried Omni? And Omni Mic. I'm like, it looks cool. But for me right now, um, I, it's, it's PC only. And for this talk, I was, I'm doing it on Mac. So I was like, well, I can't really, can't really download it if it's going to be on PC. I'm technology agnostic. I'm not pro Mac, pro PC, or whatever. I, I just use whatever tools are at my, at my disposal that are most convenient for me. And, for right now, at least for today, I'm using Mac, so I couldn't demonstrate it. But yes, that, I, that is a pretty neat piece of software, at least from the, the screenshots that I've looked at. It looks pretty neat, and it does the same sort of thing. Um, so this is gonna be my basic signal flow for if I were to use this Focusrite and this Earthworks right here. And basically, I'll, I'm gonna use the USB sound card in, goes to the computer, and then the output goes to the amplifier and then to the speaker. So I'm not gonna be demonstrating this one today, but this is how I typically do most of my measurements at home. Um, when I'm do, doing it, well, <laughs> home, lab, shop, wherever you're at. Um, so this is going to be the basic, the basic idea with this. Um, this one, the one I'm going to show today, 
is the same thing, but now instead, I'm, instead, of going to the, instead of going to a USB interface, I'm just going to go straight to the computer. So that's what I've got right here. It's USB straight into the, straight into the computer. Done. Um, very, very simple. I literally fired this up at midnight last night just to make sure it worked, and because I've never done this with this, this kind of mic before. And sure enough, so far so good. So fingers crossed. So we'll see, see how this goes. So the, in, in like, this is kind of my living room. Um, this is the same setup I have here in case all, all broke loose and I couldn't find my parts and stuff. I needed an image to show this. But, but this is, this is a basically the same setup that I'm going to be showing essentially right here. This is something I took. This is, I actually took this one a while back just to show a basic setup for this. But um, it's, 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 it's pretty close to what we've got going on today. I'm using the same. I'm using um, a basic studio monitor, a self-powered studio monitor. Whether you're using, um, when I said speaker on this last slide, So it could go to amplifier, but in the case of this, in the case of what I'm doing right now, my amplifier is built into my speaker. So it depends on your setup. But in the in the pro audio world, we tend to use self amp speakers more often than not. And just for convenience, in, in terms of this talk, I, I decided to bring this one in. This is an old one of my old studio monitors from years ago, but I use it just for watching TV these days. Um, okay. So when we take measurements, there's a few different ways, and I'll pull up. I'll pull up. Uh, we're going to dive just into the measurement system here in just a second. So I've got it fired up. Green lights on. This is on, we'll go on axis more or less. Doing it quick and dirty. Um, <coughs> actually, let's fire it up. Let's do a room with it. Oops. <laughs> no. All right. So, just I just literally downloaded room with last night. Fired it up. This is a new computer. I just got this computer like a couple weeks ago from school. So everything's fresh installed. So pretty much default settings. Um, one of the things in at least in here, what's the first thing we want to do? is go look at our preferences, which showed up over here. And we want to go look at the sound card. On this, we can see our input. And right now, this is one of those oddities in, uh, I know it's small, sorry for, for everybody in back. I can't see, it says default device, or I can go through and choose all the different, these different inputs right here that I've got. Some of them are virtual, some of them are real. But I don't see the microphone in there. So what I have to, what I have to do is go to my system, my, my Computer system press preferences, and if I look in here, I just see that there is the UMM6 as my as my as my microphone source. Output I'm not going to really worry about, but I'll go ahead and just just to make sure I'm going to go through and put it on Scarlet 2 i2. So now what I've set up as I could leave this inside Room EQ Wizard it's saying default device is going to be the the microphone input, and I believe I have the ability just to choose. Oh, <laughs> I was looking at it backwards. I was output and input. That's why I was like, why am I not seeing that? OK, that would make a lot more sense. This makes things life a little bit easier. I can still do what I was doing before, but I want to I wanna make sure that I have this right. So I'm setting the default. The, the in is UMM6. Stands for USB measurement mic. I don't know what the 6 stands for. But 6, six no need to count. Ah, thank you. Um, Scarlett 2i2 is going to be the output. We'll just stick at 44.1, but you can go to different sample rates. I guess you go up to 48. Um, and we could also do, we can um, see, uh, we're going to come in on output on the right. And input, default input, I guess. I don't know, I've played with this mic. Sweep level, we'll do it minus 12. And here you actually can go through and down download the calibration file given with the serial number from Parts Express. I'm going to leave it flat. This is a pretty decent mic. I mean, it's going to be plus or minus 2 dB most of the, the range. And, and honestly, I mean, if you, if you can get in with 2 dB, you're looking good. Like, I wouldn't worry about 2 dB plus or minus in any, in any other direction. Uh, like, th this is, I won't call them bucket measurements, but these are not like NASA grade measurements. We don't need them to be. This is, this is the, 2 dB, plus or minus 2 dB is a pretty good, a pretty narrow range. But you have the ability to do that. I just don't have the file downloaded, so I'm not going to worry about it right now. Um, more often than not, what I'm looking for is looking for relative change. So not only just how the response is, but when I change something, what changed? So, um, okay. And looking good there. So the rest of this, we don't really need to, so this is where you can do your calibration files and all the other stuff. We don't really need any of this. We're good to go. So I'm going to take, I'm going to hit my levels so I can see my, my live input right there. So they respond a little bit slow. These meters respond a little slow. And I'm going to create a generator just so I can start to, to make some sound, so I can get some decent levels here. So we want to do pink noise. Let's just do periodic pink noise. 
Was it minus 12? Since it w I set my sweep to be minus 12, we'll turn it down so it turns his head off. Press play. And we should get set. Okay. Give it some heat. I want, to, I, want to, I, want to, I want to get some decent level in there. I want to excite the room. Um, I want to get a decent signal noise level. But this is also something you should check it with your system. Try it, try it at low levels, try it at loud levels, and see, start, you start to see where your distortion kicks in, and see where your, like, what your distortion levels are. If you really start to push your system, you can start to hear, or when, when you have a room, not even room resonances, but when you have like lights that will resonate and that kind of thing, when you really start to excite the room, you're going to start to hear little things vibrate around the room. So um, you know, try it at different levels. And so again, these measurements cost you nothing. So it's just fun to sit there and just fire away. And so what I, what I typically will do is I'll just fire it away and just change one thing over and over and over in the room, whether it be acoustic treatment, or maybe you move your speaker, or maybe you uh, move the, actually, you, you just move the mic. You keep everything else the same, but you move the mic around the room and you start to spot where the room modes are and that kind of thing. So change one thing at a time. But I, I, I always, I've seen other acousticians work, and it's crazy when I see them walk in, they're like, we, we, cool, we're good. I was like, that was so cheap. Why don't, why don't you just like take a snapshot of the entire room? Like, like spend a half an hour doing it. Okay, so here we go. So now what we want to do is we're going to take a, we're going to do a measurement. It says, hey, I haven't calibrated the SPL. That, that could freak you out, but it, it shouldn't. Um, if you really want to do repeatable calibrated laboratory grade measurements, you can get a calibration tool like one of these. Basically, it puts out 94 dB SPL at one kilohertz, and you can calibrate your mic so that basically you can go through and change stuff. I think I don't know, it's a few hundred bucks. Um, not really necessary. It's just it, what we care about is relative amplitude. We don't care about tr if you really want to get the multimeter out and figure out sensitivity and, and figure out your, what your 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 <coughs> amps are doing and 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 figure out with voltage and Ohm's law. You can go through and do that, and that's really cool. But for the most part, highly unnecessary for what we're going to do. So we're just going to say continue anyway and continue on without actual, continue anyway. So we want to, we want to go, let's, let's, we don't want to go start at zero. Let's go, let's do a sweep from, let's do 20 to, two, let's go 20 to 20K. Oops. Okay. <laughs> Not 200. Length, sweeps, fall output. I'm just going to go for it. So what it's going to do now is it's going to sweep. Um, you can go through and change any of these. The longer the length, the better the measurement. You can also do, run multiples. If you're kind of in a semi-loud environment or some other interference, you can take multiples and average them together. If you want, if you're if you're worried about somebody's whatever car driving by, or if you're in a, like a factory floor or something like that, you can take multiples and, and average those out. But we're just going to keep this simple right now, just to make sure it works for the first time. So I hit it. All right, there we go. So let me, let's make this big. And so we can look at this in terms of SPL and phase. I don't know where my, there it is. For what we want right today, let's just look at just, let's just look at SPL for a moment here. And there it is. Let's take a look at my range here. I can actually set the range to be, oops, limits. I want it to be 20 to 20K. So left is 15, we'll do this as 20,000 hertz. Apply settings, okay. And we end up with something that looks like that. Pretty fuzzy. Let's do, um, let's actually do some octave smoothing. One octave, one six octaves is good. Okay. You're five dB per division there? Right, right now it is, yes. Can I ask a question? Sure. When you didn't do any smoothing, what causes those deep suck outs? On the, on the, um, on the smooth, yeah. so let, let's go back and take a look. Well, part of it is, I mean, there are those, um, and I bet you part of it could be just, um, some weird reflection type stuff. If, if we did an average and we did a few of them, you'd see some of those, those <coughs> would actually smooth out. We do see some pretty significant peaks here, but I don't like, um, also, as we go, of course, as we go, this is on a logarithmic scale, so as we go from low to high, it's going to be taking a bajillion more points up here than it is down there. So if you have an anomaly, an anomalous point, it's going to make it look, which, which when you look at the, the, the point density up here, 
if you have one that's anomalous for whatever reason, could be mathematical, could be just a room acoustic thing, that it's, it's going to give these gigantic peaks. Of course, we are seeing some, a general trend right here, right. which we still see in the other one, but, but it, it really smooths it out. And Without smoothing, uh -huh. but averaging, uh -huh. would you expect those, those deep drops to... Let's try it. So let's do, let's do four sweeps. Still got more. In fact, we probably have more now. <laughs> that's really weird. I don't know why we were getting something. That's strange. I can explain. Yeah. I have to think about that. I don't know why it's giving us such a different response. Someone back here says they can explain. It's a good answer. It's because you're taking data for the entire period of that oh. 20, hertz, um, 20 hertz signal. And so that is many, many periods at 20 kilohertz. So you're actually picking up a lot more room reflections. Mm. You're picking up reflections that go way out there. And so you've got some arrivals that are out of phase with, you know, the, the reflected energy is out of phase with the direct energy, and that's where you see those, those dips. The good yeah. news is your, your hearing usually does the job of smoothing those out right. to the tune of about a sixth of an octave. Okay, yeah, I, 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 would, I would totally believe that. Um, so we're and with about six octave, that's what we hear. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm going to get rid of this just to, just to keep it clean, just to keep this simple for right now. Um, and one of the things that I've seen people, if you're if you're doing something like EQing, if you want to try and do some correction with this, there's there's a lot of times people try and take care of those little tiny hairs, and I've heard the term "don't trim the hair off a dog, just let it just let it be." Because again, like you said, <coughs> we'll actually average a lot of that stuff out. There's no need. We're looking for general trends. Um, the variable smoothing works real well for visually. Really? I haven't actually even ever tried that before. Variable smoothing. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of cool. The other, the other part of here is what we're doing right now, to be clear, is we're, we're measuring the speaker in the room. We're taking an entire capture of the room. It may be that you want to look at just the speaker response. And so sometimes, it, in, in, in the case of this, of, of weeding out potential issues in your system, you want, to, you want to remove as many variables as you can. And one of the first things you want to do is, well, is my speaker performing the way it's supposed to, the way the manufacturer told it to? And what you can actually do is you can actually gate this measurement. And by doing the gating thing, what, off of what he was just saying, basically it's, it's <coughs> averaging, it's getting, it's, it's the impulse, if we look at the impulse itself right here, it's, it's, um, this is doing some pretty cool trick. This, this log sweep that we're doing, what it's actually doing, if you've ever watched any acousticians go into like a hall or something, especially the old school, Sabine and old school acousticians would pop balloons or clap hands or do this. That's something that we actually will do when we want to test just subjectively walk into a room. We're like, okay. That is an impulse. An impulse is all frequencies of e energy at the same time. But what we're doing is we're actually doing a log sweep where we sweep that up, but we do a little bit of math magic and what we're going to do is we're going to compress that entire log sweep. That we're going to squeeze all that to time zero. So what we're looking at here is actually as if it were a clap, and and we were able to look at the the energy over time. Um, and what you can do is if we gate this, if we if we only listen to the sound from the speaker to the microphone before the first reflection. In the case of this, it'd be the floor. It would come off the floor and come back up. If I say only listen for and we can do some math to figure out what that time would be, something on the order of like four milliseconds or something like that, that we, we would able, actually be able to gate this thing and we would actually be able to listen to this in true anechoic response. You don't need an anechoic chamber to get an anechoic response. But the problem with that gating is that it's only going to give you down to about 200 hertz at best, um, unless you have a gigantic room and you can get your speakers really high off the floor. But you can do this. And so it can, you can tell if there's something wrong with your tweeter, if there's something wrong with your crossovers. This will help you identify if there, or some sort of diffraction <coughs> problem with your, with your speakers. Um, and the way you would do that is it's in your, it's in your preferences. Um, pull up preferences again. 
think it's analysis. It's been a while since I've done this. You can, you can choose where you want and how long you want the gate. It says choose the windows. You can choose how long you want the window width to be. I'm going to leave it open because I, in the name of today, we're going to consider this as a room speaker response, the entire system. But like I said, you can do true anechoic measurements of your speaker. And I should note that you also should be doing this on one speaker at a time. You don't do this with both. And you, why? Why would I not do this through both speakers at the same time? I'm not sure. Which also, you're right, it's time difference, which creates what? Phase cancellation. Phase cancellation. So you're going to get all sorts of weird phase cancellations because of the time, time delay between two different speakers. You're going to get comb filtering big time. And it's going to make your, you're going to have a heart attack when you look at your speaking thing. It's going to look like, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and most people have a heart attack when they look at these things anyway, because they're like, how much did I just spend on my system when I ran this and my low frequency sucks? And you're like, no, it doesn't suck. It's your room, it, it, it doesn't suck. You just have to, you just need some little help. Can you quickly go back to the preferences and the analysis and uh, what did you, how did you set the window? There? So you uh, turn this, it says, turn, set the impulse width automatically. So I could set this width to be something like four milliseconds. So that's your window width is uh, basically your gate. Yeah, and so what they're doing actually, like actually I should put this, so what they're gonna do is, this is the, on the left side of what they determined to be the zero point. So let me get out of this for just for a minute, minute and I'll show you what it's doing. I can, the, the left side says, looking at this dotted line right here, how much time do you wanna to listen to prior to this? And the other one is, the right side is, how much do you wanna to listen to post this? So I would put z probably negative 0.1, or sorry, 0.1 millisecond to the left and four milliseconds to the right, depending. And basically what you would do is, you just have to determine what your first reflection is. Yes. And, and you just make sure that it's less than that first reflection and you'll get that. And generally at one meter, so I do one meter speaker heights, one meter apart, and that's about, and I get down to about 200 hertz resolution. Anything below that, the, the problem is the wavelength takes too long, it takes longer than four milliseconds to resolve. So you can't actually get, you can't get low frequency information unless you have a gigantic room. The higher, you know, if you, if you have access to a gymnasium, you can't do, out, doing outside measurements is really hard. But um, I've seen some pretty crazy stuff. <laughs> but, but you can, um, but if you have access to a larger room, you can actually get lower resolution, lower frequency resolution. Uh, regularly, 200 hertz up. More or less, yep. And that's honestly, that's that's. I mean, that's going to be the money range right there. Everything down below there is going to be weird room modes and stuff, and we're going to look at that here in just a second. But you can't look at your speaker. You can't look at your speaker response by itself, because again, you have to you have to take the speaker in the room as an entire system. You can't just say, "Oh, my speakers are putting flat down to 30 hertz." If you put it in a room, all bets are off anyway. So, yeah. So you're doing a swept sign measurement, and from that you look at the you look at then you take the Right, and you can look at the frequency response. Yeah, you can also do the phase. There's all sorts of information, right. but yes. But the time, the time gate works in the impulse domain, right? So you still have to convert. It's pre, it's pre, -conver it's pre conversion, yes. And so then that's why, that's why, because the FFT won't be able to look at anything below that because you only has this much time to work with. So the FFT can't look below 200 hertz. There's just no information below there. Because, uh, uh, it can't yeah. take up a full period of that length. Like that's that's, that's thing. Demonstration might be better. Does something change the sweep frequency? No, you can still sweep from that. You just the FFT, the, the math, the Fourier transform. Just literally, there is not enough for one period of time for that entire for that entire cycle for the, okay. that one entire period is but longer than that gate is sweep longer rate than that. Ends up being the same. I'm sorry. For the, for the frequencies that you do measure, the sweep rate. Is yeah. The same? Yep. Yes. I would do that. It's just there's no reason not to. So I mean, you, like, I, like unless you're looking, if you're just doing your subwoofers, you could go from 20 to 200 if you don't really care about the high frequency stuff. But again, this data is cheap. It, it, these measurements are cheap. You might as well just sweep it, and then you've got it captured, and you can always go back and just disregard other information. Um, and this is pretty neat because you can actually look at other stuff in here. You can look at your RT60s. Um, you can look at your waterfall, which is pretty neat. Let's get. I don't know why I have that up there. Um, so where's my generator? There it is. Oops. So I can look at, you can look at the, start to look at the time, frequency, and energy in the room. So this is really, this is where you can start to see what the trouble is. Because this is, this is why we take impulses. This is why you don't use pink noise for, for these measurements. Pink noise only gives you a, essentially a two-dimensional analysis. It gives you frequency and amplitude. Whereas an impulse gives you frequency, amplitude, and time. It's an acoustic snapshot of your room. And so you can look at this in a lot of different ways po in post. So we can look at this case. We can start to see, I'm showing right now from zero to 200. See, I'll scoot this over a little bit. And you can start to see 
what you were looking for are any fins that are hanging out for a really long time that are going to show you either you've got, a, you've got a, either a speaker problem or an acoustics problem. Generally, if you're dealing with reasonable speakers, it's going to be an acoustics problem. But it, you know, it, it's something to consider if you've got something wrong with your speaker. If there's something resonating on your speaker, something buzzing, or if you're using some really flubby subwoofers or something like that, they're going to really ring for a really long time. Because our goal is, when, when we think about speakers, oftentimes we, we, we often think about frequency response, but we also have to really consider transient response. Transient response is one of those that you don't really see on spec sheets, but it shows you how well it performs in time. And again, it's including your room. So if I just show you amazing, you'll see these people showing their impulse response to their speakers on their spec sheets. You're like, wow, that looks amazing. You put it in your room, again, all bets are off because your room actually resonates itself. But this gives you, start to give you insights. And what you're looking for, I mean, generally what we want to see is reasonably smooth fall off on this. And whether you like a really live room or really a dead room or somewhere in between. I like my rooms completely dead. I, my, my mastering room is really dead. People walk in there, it feels like your ears need to pop. It's not anechoic, but it's really, really quiet compared to what most people are used to. A lot of normal people like it, <laughs> like it'll have, have a certain reverb time that they're shooting for. But I like my, I like to hear the music. I don't wanna hear my room. That's just me. I, so that's where sub subjectivity comes into play. There is no, and that's the beauty of all this stuff. There's no such thing as perfect. We all have our subjective opinions on this. There's certain accuracy things that we're going for, but we all have our own, own opinions on this stuff. And that's part of the beauty of this whole scene. Is there's, no, there's no such thing as a perfect speaker. And, and I love that. As a designer, that's the fun part. It's, all, it's, it's working within these constraints and compromises. You have, to, you, have to, you have to find something that works for you. So if your stimulus was a stop sign, does your stimulus ever run just an impulse? You, could, you can do that. In fact, so if you, if you have, like if you're in a pinch, I've seen people, um, if you want to go, because the cool thing with impulse is you can apply that acoustic snapshot, you can use that as reverb for other s signals. So I can, in audio production, I can take whatever, some gigantic hall that's famous, some musical hall, and I can apply that. But sometimes people want to do these crazy spaces and you're not allowed to, they're like museums and stuff. And you're not really allowed to go set up all this equipment. So you run in there with a field recorder and some balloons and you just go pop them before security catches you. And, you can get them. So, and, so, and so you can do that, and then you can just drop those in here, and you can take a look at those spaces, and it's, it's, it's actually pretty fun. Um, so you're seeing the same kind of information right here, but we're looking at it in terms of, um, let's try to get that here. Uh, I have to do zoom. But basically, we see have low frequency to high frequency. This is time in this direction right here, and then amplitude is the, is the brightness of the color out. It's the same thing as the, the waterfall display we were looking at right there, the, a second ago. It's but like you're looking at the top down. Yep, exactly. Um, and it looks really pretty, especially when you're trying to like show people show people specs and stuff like that. Just one looks really cool. So, but again, what you're looking for here is if you start to see really long fins hanging out, that shows you that there's some sort of resonance or some sort of indication that something's going on there, and that's that maybe something you need to address. Um, there's all sorts of other things that this, this software can do for you. Again, it can also do do it can do just generate it can generate pink noise, sine waves. Um, you could do a RTA, so you can actually look at like just the real-time analyzer stuff. Again, I don't really use this. I don't think this gives you really very useful information. It's good just to see what's going on as a quick snapshot, just as a throw it up there and see what's going on. But I don't really use RTAs for very much. Um, but you can look at like group delay. Uh, you can also look at distortion, which this is this one's really cool. Um, this is something I think that's really useful in your system. You can go through and again, I have this thing set. So we can look at harmonic distortion. So here's my, here's my SPL, and our harmonic distortion, our first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, sixth harmonic. And from this, you can start to go, oh, I'm getting some weird, some weird harmonic distortion. You can see if, like, at, and this kind of makes sense, at 20 hertz, this little tiny speaker isn't out, it'd be able to output 20 hertz very well, and so that's, that driver's moving like crazy, and it's squaring off, and so you're gonna start getting a fair amount of harmonic distortion there. Here, we're like, oh, wait a minute, what's this going on right here? That's a little strange to me, one kilohertz. Well, that could be something with the crossover. It can show you that there's, that there's something going on in there. But again, it just shows you that it's something to address. And we're looking at, it can show it to you in terms of percentage, which I think is off the screen right now. You can't, I don't know why, why we're not able to see it. But you can look at your percentage, and because again, this kind of sometimes will freak you out, but it oftentimes will just show you, is there a problem with my system? And, and again, it, it gives you some huge insight. And the cool thing is you can look at all this in post. You can just like take a bunch of sweeps, and then you go sit down on your couch, and crunch on this for a little while and go to the forums and, and see, see what's going on there. But um, overall, I mean, the spectrum doesn't look too bad. We're going up. 
yeah, we see a pretty good dip right around 3.5K right there. Looking straight on. Another one that's kind of fun to do is just do an off axis response. Let's just do the same thing again, just to see. And what I usually will do is do it on five degree increments and take a look at your, you can look at your, um, oops, I want to do, was it M? I want to do a single sweep again. Let's just do a single. And we'll start to, oops, no. I'll, I guess we'll just do the same since we have it here. And so we can start to see, okay, as I, as I go off axis, my high frequencies are gonna roll off and that's to be expected. And so you can see at what rate you're, and you can look at radiation patterns of your, of your tweeters and, and possibly look at diffraction issues. If you start to see weird, huge dips right there, that yes, we're starting, to, the, the low frequencies should be pretty much the same, but at, well, this is actually crazy, kind of around 500 hertz. I would expect it to be higher than that, but I would expect it to be more around one kilohertz. But again, knowing your own system, fun. It's, it's, it's super cheap, super easy. So you should just start moving the microphone around and see what, see what changes. Okay, I need to move on though, because we got a lot more to get to. Well, I guess before, before I move on though, like I'm still gonna keep coming back to Ruby Q Wizard right here. Um, actually, there's two, two, a couple other things I wanna show. Um, the other one is, this EQ, if you happen to have EQ in your system, like say you're using, um, these are just some generic ones in it, or some, some regular ones in here. Say you've got some mini DSP, or like, so they've got the mini, D they actually got a lot of mini DSPs in there. But if you've got any of these kind of DSPs in your system, you could say, okay, I've got the mini DSP 96K. And I can put, I wanna put my target settings in. It's not a subwoofer, it's a full range. And filter tasks. We'll say, we want to go higher than that. I'll just put in 20K. It, I think it only goes up to 10K. But. And I'm just going to hit go. It's been a while since I've used this thing. Yeah. Generate. Is that it? No. <laughs> I haven't done this one in a while. Oh, there it is. You keep it with? No. You have to tell it to go. And what it'll do is it'll actually tell you what parameters to put in for all of your EQ settings to flatten out your, your system. It's pretty cool. Um, you know, if different people have different ideas, not as useful for maybe audiophile, hi-fi enthusiasts where your systems are pretty good and throwing DSP in there is you know, considered bad juju. But in the pro audio world, when you're like EQing a gigantic PA system, you have to use EQ. And so this tells you what you should be using. So um, that's pretty useful. And it's also got this room simulation, which I'll come back to in a minute. But this shows, this is kind of going back to what we were talking about before, where you talk about where the room, where the speaker placement is versus the room. And you can see the room modes and see what's going on there. 10 minutes? 10 minutes, okay. So I'll come back to this here in just a moment because I want to actually get back to um, talk here for a second. So that's just a basic measurement. So we can look at, oh, I didn't really show the phase. Let me just show phase. If we get out of here, you can, you can, you can start to look at your your. Uh, you can't. Oh, this is the phase right here. This is SPL down here. Maybe the same color, which kind of sucks. But you can start to look and look at your phase shift as a function of frequency. Uh -huh. You're going to have some phase shift, and so that just it, it just gives you again insight as what's going on inside your speaker. Um, the high frequency looks really weird. Yeah. So what it's doing is it's it's going through, and it's. I mean, that's actually not that unusual. You'll start. You will see it on the the phase shifting as a function, as it goes up. So what it's doing is it's going from uh, 180, to, positive 180 to negative 180, so 360 degrees total, and it's just unwrapping. So it's, it's the, sh the phase is continuous shifting, 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 which is actually what we would expect. Um, but, and as we go higher in frequency, it's gonna shift faster and more because we're on a logarithmic scale here. Isn't that so, because of the placement of the microphone away from the loudspeaker? No, 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 this is just, um, it's... Because there's no time correction for that microphone no, and you can do that. So there actually, if you, if you feel like it, you can actually do a loop back. And so it can do a time, it, you can actually measure the time difference if you want to measure the time, the, the time delay. But that, again, that's not really that useful for us. If you really want to figure out, like figure out the distance from a microphone that you, you can use that. Sometimes in the old school way of doing it, you do a loop back for a flatness because the, the sound card would have its own EQ properties and you could null those out, but uh, measure against those. But Everything's so flat these days, that's really not really an issue. 
but the, the, the phase shift is just um, a function of the sweep as it goes up. It's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna shift phase. It gets a little it's more complicated. You're squeezing, pushing. Yes, yes. You're, so your 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 phase is shifting as a function of time. Frequency can be defined, can be described in a few different ways. But one of them is, is is phase versus time. If you look at the wave equation, I don't want to go down that road right now because it gets it gets it gets really complicated. But we can we can certainly address this on a, at a different time. Okay. Um, there's the gating thing to talk about. So here's the kind of interesting part. Now here's here's what I want to start talking about is this idea of when you're looking at the low frequencies, because this is what everyone freaks out about. When you, when you do these sweeps in a room, that the low frequencies have these plus or minus 20 dB dips and peaks, and everyone kind of loses it, and they're like, oh man, should I start throwing EQ in my system? No, don't. No amount of EQ is gonna help your system in this, in this regard. It's, it's, in fact, it's usually gonna make it worse, because this is where you have to, this is where physics kicks in. So up here, and the larger your room, so we, you can look at the speaker, uh, like when, you, when I look at the response here, the high frequencies are coming from the, speak, the, the speaker. The low frequencies are coming, the response is coming from the room, well, speaker and room itself at the same time. So this is something, if I see some dips and peaks up in the higher regions right here, that may be a good candidate for EQ uh, or some sort of correction or switching out the tweeters or something, you know, some, something along the lines. Something like you know, changing cables won't really change the high frequencies, I mean, with, like in, in, in any usable effect. But if you have, a system that has capable of DSP, and we're starting to see that. Like I've seen a lot more this year than I ever have before. Go, go back 10 years ago with these kind of things, and DSP was considered so taboo. And now we're starting to see, you know, people are are warming up to this idea. Um, I, I like DSP, not for everything, but I do. I, I'm a believer in using DSP for quite a bit. You can also just use analog EQs too. I mean, if you, if it's, it's 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 a it's a candidate for for possible EQ, but but go light. But then below here, we start to see these gigantic peaks down here. That means that's the room, your room response. The low frequency is going to have to do with where, where your speaker is and where your microphone is or your listening position is in that room. And going back to Room EQ Wizard for just a moment, when we looked at this simulation, this, once again, this is, we would, we'll, uh, this is an idealized, perfectly flat subwoofer. Say it's a subwoofer that goes from 20 hertz to 200 hertz, perfectly flat. With nothing else, this is what your room is doing to your. This is what your room is doing to your to your signal, because of because of room reflections. So that's a little spooky, and so and so that's why we're seeing these gigantic dips and peaks, right there. And so there may be other ones where like, okay, well maybe I'll. Uh, um, I don't want to do that one. So that's simulating where the you set the microphone is by. You're simulating where the speaker is, and it's it's yep. going to simulate your response. Yep. Yeah, see if you can find some correlation there. But in the real world, you don't see windows, you don't see furniture, you don't see all these other things that are gonna have some influence on there, and the, the wall materials themselves, and there's some other things in there. But yes, you should see something relatively correlate to that. And also, I mean, even if you look at where the microphone position, how much it changes just by a little bit. What happens if you put the speaker all the way to the corner? Let's go all the way to the corner. <coughs> and as I walk around the room, if I go to the side of this room, it's going to be gigantic and around, what is that, 50 hertz or 43 hertz? And then I found a knoll right there, or let's see if I can find it as I walk around the room. You're going to get crazy room responses right here. And indeed, this is actually what happens. So that's what I want to get to right now. Let's do this. Let's put this to the test. Um, so to do this, we need to know, talk about speed correction. Yep. Let's get to this low frequency stuff. We need to understand standing waves. For, that, for, this to for this to work. So I'm just going to kind of blast through this because we, we're, we're going to be running out of time here. But um, this is what the way we look at it in terms of acousticians. Our first mode of oscillation right here is going to be a null right here and an antinode right here. So it's a node, antinode. Pressure, pressure antinode, node, antinode. Meaning it's really, really freaking loud over here in the corner. Thank you. Nothing here, crazy loud over here. What frequency is that? Well, we, that's where this little handy dandy equation comes in. V equals F times lambda. Velocity equals frequency times wavelength. Now, we don't usually use it in this, this form. Velocity isn't defined by frequency and wavelength. And they're all related. But usually what we want to do is we want to we solve for frequency or wavelength. And 
know the, freak, uh, the velocity divided by the frequency. What's the, what's the velocity? 343 meters per second. So I'm a scientist. I come from a science background. I work only in metric. Drives people crazy. But <laughs> we, we need to get with the rest of the world. We're, we're, one of, we're the only country. Well, there's two other countries. Anyone that know what the other, only two other countries in the world that are not on the metric system? Liberia? Burma and Liberia. <laughs> we're the only ones. I mean, how arrogant is that? <laughs> and so we make every mechanic on the planet buy two sets of tools. <laughs> That's just the part, small part of it. This is why things blow up from NASA and all these things happen. So I, I, work, at, I work exclusively in metric. But if you want to work in, if you want to work in feet, this is, this is 1126 feet per second. Um, and it's the, same, it's, the same, it's the same math. If you just 11.6. 1126. 26. Yep. Um, it's 1126 feet per second. And that's the speed of sound at 20 degrees C at sea level, but close enough for what we're doing today. So let's take a look at this. So let's, let's do some, some examples here. 20 kilohertz, 1.72 centimeters. That's that big. That's the highest frequency you can hear as a wavelength of this. So as an acoustician, what I do is I start to hear, I, I hear, I see rooms in terms of wavelength. But 20 hertz, 17 meters. Is that longer than the length of this room, you think, from this way? Yeah. That's about it. It's probably about, that's probably pretty close. It's 10 of these, right? Pretty close. So uh, it's, it's uh, so 10,000 of those. 1,000 of those. 1,000, yeah, it'd be 1,000 of those. Yeah. So it's a, from this side of the room to that side of the room, it's, it's 20 hertz, it's the lowest frequency that you can hear there. And of course, 202K, we're looking at there. So 2, K, two, two kilohertz, which is about the width of your head. This is why we hear all sorts of weird diff diffraction problems with your head. Um, at right around 2 kilohertz, weird stuff. Head related transfer function happens. 200 hertz. Six feet, something like that. Yeah. Okay. So let's do this. So I, again, I, I, I'm gonna frequency equals v over lambda. Lambda equals two l, and the reason is because of the the that room. I I, I don't want to go down this for too long, but this if you're gonna do this math, this is the one you need right here. F equals v over two l. That will tell you the fundamental mode of oscillation for any room. What's the, what do you suppose the width of this room is? In meters. Feet. In meters. 4.8 meters. All right. Probably a little laser thing because I don't have time. 5.66. Help me out with that. What's the answer on that? 343 divided by 2 times 5.66. Can I calculators? Okay, I got I to gotta get out of here. Austin's going to bum me out. So, yeah, what time is it? Would you see a bump in the amplitude response there? So, Let's do this. 30 hertz. Thir so it's about 30 hertz? OK, so the third mode of oscillation for that is going to be 90 hertz. Just because I want you guys to experience this before we go. So the frequency is going to be, what did I say? It's 5.66. Pretty much right there. OK, bring this up. Third mode of oscillation. Make this kind of loud. Actually, let's go to the second, because we can certainly get to 60, 60 hertz. I'm going to put this in the, in, the, in the corner of the room. Whoa. But I want you, like, I, I don't feel like that's quite right. What did I say? It was five, let's see, it's 5.66. As we leave here, what I want you guys to do, because I, I have to wrap it up here. If I go back to this, I back it up a couple slides, 60 hertz. This is what we're looking at right here. I want you to walk around the room as we wrap up here. And I want you to, I want you to listen for these quiet points and these loud points. Walk back and forth and back and forth the hall. But we'll give you one second, because I'm going to wrap up this. I'll come back to the slide as we, as we leave here. But I want to wrap up because uh, just to show you, yeah. this suggested reading, Master Handbook of Acoustics. Go back, please. Oh, did it? <laughs> it was trying to catch up there. Master Handbook of Acoustics. Good book. Sound Reproduction by Floyd Tool. Amazing book. These are the two books you should read. Under fifty bucks for the two of them. Read through them. I've read through them three or four times. They're amazing, 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 amazing books. If you want these slides, hit me up. This is my contact information. I'm, I'm happy to give them to you. 
Take quick pictures of those. That's my information. I have cards up here in a second. That's my information. Hit me up anytime. I'm happy to answer any questions anytime. I'm going to go back to that slide though so you can see and experience that and, and, and walk around the room and see if you can experience what you see on the screen. And again, this is just for one mode of oscillation. We could do this for a lot more modes of oscillation, but this shows why you need to. Oh, yeah, it's working good. Walk around. So, what I want you guys to do is just, as you leave, touch, go from wall to wall right there. Yeah. So, cool. Thank you guys. I will catch you guys later. Catch me up. I'll be outside here.